All right, good morning and afternoon. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Grazing to Maintain Perennial Bunch Grasses and Reduce Non-Native Annuals, presented by Kirk Davies with the Agricultural Research Service in Burns, Oregon. Before I introduce our presenter, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions or comments for the speaker or me, please type them into the questions window of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field your questions for um, the presenter after the presentation. I also wanna let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation. So you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio window and check your audio selections. Now I'll introduce our presenter. Kirk Davies is a rangeland scientist with the USDA Agricultural Re Research Service at the Eastern Oregon Agricultural Research Center in Burns, Oregon. He received a dual BS in rangeland resources and, and crop and soil science and a PhD in rangeland resources from Oregon State University. He joined the USDA Agricultural Research Service as a rangeland scientist in October of 2006. Kirk's research focuses on vegetation patterns, disturbance ecology, climate and management influences on rangeland vegetation, sagebrush bunch grass community ecology, and invasive plant prevention, control, and ecology. Welcome, Kirk, and thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm going to talk about how to maintain perennial grasses and reduce um, non-native annuals, focusing in on annual grasses. And this is with grazing. And a large focus, of course, will be the interaction between fire and grazing. So why the focus on perennial grasses? Well, perennial grasses are the dominant understory plant functional group in native sagebrush rangelands. And the common species, of course, are like blue bunch wheatgrass, needle grasses, or needle and thread, squirrel tail, bluegrass, and fescues. And these species occur across the sagebrush range, occupying different climatic and site characteristics. The perennial bunch grasses, of course, and just perennial grasses in general, are cribbit critical habitat element for many species in the sagebrush ecosystem, providing both hiding cover as well as forage. They're, oops. They're also critical for livestock forage production. So this, you know, perennial bunch grasses make up the majority of the livestock forage on sagebrush rangelands. Also critically important is that because they're the most dominant herbaceous plant functional group out there. They use a lot of the resource in these plant communities. As you can see in this picture here, there's a lot of bare ground around this blue bunch wheatgrass. And it's not that this plant community is open to invasion, it's the fact that the roots of these plants, these perennial bunch grasses are occupying that inner space, taking up those resources, preventing exotic annual grasses to come in. So why, do, why are we concerned about the exotic annual grasses? And the reason is that they're not as a reliable livestock forage as perennial bunch grasses. They're much more responsive to interannual variation in climate. So if we have an overly wet year, we're gonna have a lot of annual grasses. If we have a really dry year, we're not gonna have much in the way of annual grass production. Annual grass invasion also decreases um, biodiversity. Matter of fact, as annual grass abundance increases, you have an expeditional decline in native diversity. Annual grasses also dry out much earlier in the growing season. As you can see in this picture here, the blue bunch wheatgrass in the foreground is lush and green, and the cheatgrass in the foreground is dry enough to already burn. You can also see from this fuel or this picture, the other problem is that annual grasses create a much more continuous fine fuel. The fact that it's dry and continuous greatly elevates the risk of more frequent wildfires and more frequent wildfires are a problem for native species, as well as they're very costly as we have to repeatedly attempt to you know, put out these fires as well as restore these areas after they're burned. So as I said before, perennial bunch grasses and other perennial grasses greatly limit exotic annual grasses. 
As you can see from this graph here of Medusa head density, you see that as perennial bunch grass density increases, Medusa head density or other exotic annual grasses decrease exponentially. So that uh, overlap in resource use between perennial grass and annual grasses makes them very good competitor with annual grass. And of course, because they're so abundant in these plant communities, they're the most likely herbaceous functional group to limit our annual grasses. So therefore, the perennial bunch grasses are very critical to keeping annual grasses in check. So what can we do to manage perennial bunch grasses? The two main things that we can manage, and this is to some degree, is grazing and of course fire. Of course, grazing is ubiquitous across the sagebrush steppe. Almost all sagebrush steppe is grazed. And of course, uh, wildfire is a risk across the entire sagebrush steppe too. And neither is necessarily good or bad, but both can have negative consequences if they occur under certain um, scenarios. And we'll go into that in more detail. And of course then, because grazing and fire occur across the sagebrush um, rangelands, there's an interaction between them that's critical. So how does grazing influence perennial bunch grasses? And the most basic level is that it removes, if you're grazing during the growing season, you're removing photosynthetic active materials. And if you remove too much photosynthetic active material, grazed plants will be placed at a disadvantage with ungrazed plants. And then also plants that grow slower, like our native bunch grasses compared to cheat grass, you know, they'll be placed at a disadvantage with these, these species that rapidly grow, which is usually our exotic annuals. As we graze heavily in the growing season, we can also remove reproductive efforts. So the reproductive combs of the perennial bunch grasses are growing up and if they're being grazed off, we're not having seed production. Now on the other end, by grazing these plants, we're also removing fuel and potentially in that time frame, decreasing the fire threat. So grazing management, the real important thing with grazing management is the timing and intensity of grazing. Perennial bunch grasses and other perennial native species are most sensitive to grazing early in the year. So the most damaging grazing is of course, heavily repeated defoliation in the spring, especially repeated year after year with heavy defoliation. And this will decrease the basal area over time of our perennial bunch grasses. And this creates a problem because over time as we reduce these plants, less and less resources is taken up by them. And at some point it causes mortality too. So essentially the, the worst kind of grazing we can have is year after year spring grazing that's heavy. Now there's also distribution issues. And the problem here is that the average utilization of a pasture may be fairly moderate, but there's going to be patches that the, that the livestock repeatedly select and those areas may be they overutilize and then areas that they don't select may not even be touched. The consequences of improper grazing result, of course, in a decrease in our perennial bunch grasses, both in size and abundance, and that opens these plant communities up to exotic annual grass invasion. Proper grazing, on the other hand, is more of a rotation style grazing. And it's not like these small pastures where we rotate the animals throughout in a year. It's rotating the season of use on these so that one year it may be grazed in the growing season and then the next year it's not grazed till after the growing season. And then of course within this, inc incorporating periodic periods of complete rest to allow these plant communities to go through their life cycle and produce seeds without being defoliated. The other critical component is that we don't wanna do heavy defoliation. We wanna do light to moderate utilization so up to about 50% utilization of our native ranges. And the key factor here is that we wanna limit the competitive advantage of dis or ungrazed plants have over our grazed plants. And also if we're keeping the utilization levels low, there will be some reproductive effort every year producing seeds, you know, restocking the seed bank in case there's a disturbance and they need to reestablish plants. The other important part is of course to try to manage utilization. So there isn't this situation where livestock are repeatedly selecting the same area to graze over and over again. So this has to be managed to more even distribute the livestock across these um, 
rangeland allotments. There are also some opportunities to graze to impact the exotic annuals. An exotic annual, especially cheatgrass, sometimes grow when our native perennials are not growing. And this often happens in the fall and the winter. So there's an opportunity to go in here and graze these plants, reduce their vigor, and not negatively impact our native perennial grasses. This has to be really carefully applied because our native perennial bunch grasses may not be growing when we turn cows out, but with a little bit of warm weather, they may start growing and then the, they're going to be in a situation where they are highly desirable and also most sensitive to grazing effects. So this can be done and it just needs to be carefully applied. So grazing and fire, we're getting kind of in the big picture here. So fire, as we know, can increase exotic annual grasses. And this is because when any of these rangelands burnt, it releases a lot of nutrients that's tied up in vegetation and increase the nutrients, abundance of nutrients favors exotic annuals. Can also decrease perennial grasses, especially around sagebrush where we have the hotter fire burning, we get elevated temperatures and we lose perennial bunch grasses. Anytime we lose perennial bunch grasses, it means there's a bunch of resources and space available to exotic annuals to get a foot step in there. So how does grazing influence fire? We'll get into that in more detail, but the reason grazing is an option is it's really one of the only treatments that we can apply at the landscape scale that's still feasible. Now we can have fire breaks within rangelands and stuff like that, but ultimately the area between the fire breaks is untreated unless we do it with something like grazing. Now not to say it's not without challenges. It's not as simple as we're gonna go graze everything and everything's gonna be hunky-dory there has to be some very strategic applied stuff. But I'm gonna go through talking about proper grazing as it affects um, fire. And this is not to say just grazing, this is proper grazing. So this is fuel buildup in grazed and non-grazed rangelands. And throughout this discussion of grazing effects, I'm talking about moderate grazing, about 40% utilization, usually um, rotated through one year will be grazed early, the next year will be grazed after the growing season, and every three to five years, it would have a complete year of rest. So this is the buildup of fuel, and the gray is the non-grazed, and the black is the grazed. And STC is standing crop. That's just the erect vegetation from this year and the prior years that's still standing you know, in the, in the allotment. It's not on the ground, it's not litter. What we see is that it's more than double with not grazing. And these weren't grazed before measurements, this was grazed the year before measurements. So the, stand, the, the total herbaceous production from that year, the living um, biomass from these plants is the same. Interestingly, we found that litter was the same. And then of course, total is doubled. So we're seeing that, that by not grazing these areas, we get a buildup of fuel of about twice as much herbaceous fuel. Also important in terms of fuel, besides just the, the amount, is also stuff like the height and the continuity. And the continuity of the fuel, the more continuous the fuel is, the more likely a fire can spread easily through that rangeland, as well as much more likely to not have unburned patches in it. And we see that in this graph here that the grazed area has significantly less continuous perennial bunch grass fuel, and it also has larger fuel gaps. So the fuel is less, less continuous and then there's bigger gaps out here. This is real important to how it affects fire. I don't have a graph of this, but we saw of course a similar deal with herbaceous vegetation height. With grazing, it greatly reduced it, especially the dead uh, fuel from the prior year. We look at it, but that was kind of looking at the more the community level. If we look at it, the individual bunch grass, and the reason we want to do that is because we want the individual bunch grass to survive the fire. So there's about three times the buildup of fuel on ungrazed perennial bunch grasses. And over time, this results in increased fuel depth sitting on top that perennial bunch grass. These ungrazed plants also end up having larger dead centers. And so that means your meristematic tissue is, surround, or is surrounding a pocket of dead condensed fuel that was, has the potential to burn hot and for longer than say a bunch grass that's all living material. Now, 
partially to show that this grazing is, is moderate and proper, the actual production of each one of these in each individual year is the same. The grazing is not negatively affecting the ability of these perennial bunch grasses to produce biomass in the next year, but it is affecting the buildup of fuel and changing the structure by reducing that dead uh, um, center. This is um, a picture in the buzzard fire, and it was the, taken the second growing season after the fire. So the first growing season after the fire, there was a substantial um, increase in cheatgrass across an area that was dominated by natives. And then there was a bit, this huge amount of dead dry fuel out there, which was of course of a management concern of the risk of it reburning. So they applied winter grazing to this to reduce the fuel. And you can look at the two pictures here and you can see that it was very effective. You can, can't even see the, hardly the native perennial bunch grasses because of all the cheatgrass litter in the non-grazed area. As well as in the winter grazed area, you can see all the individual perennial bunch grasses. It looks pretty good. This is pretty concerning if it wasn't grazed. If this whole landscape looked like the non-grazed, it would essentially be able to burn at the time this picture was taken because of all that residual fuel from cheatgrass from the year before. So this is an opportunity to use grazing to reduce the risk of a subsequent fire. Now, that being said, this area wasn't seeded. If this area was seeded with our desirable perennial bunch grasses because it had lost a bunch of them, we couldn't graze them. We have to be very cautious of that, that the plants would need to establish, not be so um, small and weak that they could be pulled out by grazing. This isn't from the this last um, from the buzzard fire. This is actually a native rangeland that hadn't burned, so it had sagebrush and perennial bunch grass in it. And this is our fuel moisture content. The open circles are the winter grazed, and then the black filled in area is the ungrazed. This red line going across it, the fuel moisture of extinction. Essentially, anything above that red line is too wet to burn. Anything below it would probably readily burn. And what we see is that the ungrazed area, because of that buildup of fuel from prior years, is dry enough to burn in the end of June. Whereas the winter grazed area was not dry enough to burn till the end of August. And even then, even at the end of our sampling, going into September, that winter grazed area had higher fuel moisture than the ungrazed area. What this is showing us that as it grazing is by removing that dead fuel from the prior years can greatly shrink up the period of time that that plant community can burn. And that decreases essentially the potential for that to be the wildfire season for that area. And in this case, it reduced it by a month and a half and left a very small window when it would be burnable. And this is a wild and big sagebrush community. This isn't a high elevation site. It's about 4,500 feet. So this vastly changed whether or not this plant community would burn, whether it was grazed or not. So we've been looking at grazing effects on fuels and we saw some pretty substantial effects there. The next step of course is what would happen if you know, a fire tried to start here? What's the probability that we'd have a wildfire propagation? To have that, we have to have the ignition source, which would be lightning or a match or a cigarette butt. Then that has to, of course, contact fuel and ignite that fuel. And then for that to actually then become a fire, that ignited fuel then has to have the fire spread to other fuel. So we, we actually wanted to look at this in fall grazed, spring grazed, and ungrazed areas. And we did this at five sites. And then we did it in two months. And in each month, July and August, which is the peak wildfire season, we did 20 ignition attempts and looked at what, whether or not we had initial ignition. So this is our results. So initial ignition probability. And we can see that both the fall graze and the spring graze in July was half as likely to have that ignition source start some fuel on fire. We go into August, we see the same thing. So it didn't matter whether it was fall grazed or spring grazed, either one of them greatly reduced the probability that if we had an ignition source out there, they would actually light some fuel on fire. So if, if that fuel got lit on fire, did it spread was the next question. 
And so we took that and we looked at the next step. It's the same configuration with the black being the fall grays, the light gray being spring grays, and then the dark gray being ungrazed. And we see in July that both the fall grays and the spring grays greatly reduce the probability that that fire would spread. It's, it's three times, a little more than three times as likely to spread in the ungrazed area. Now we went to August, the fall grazed was vastly different than the spring grazed at that point, but still a lot less than the ungrazed area. But it does show an effect of the season of grazing on the likelihood of fire spread. But still both grazings decreased the risk of fire spread compared to the ungrazed area. So we've established that it affects fuels. We established that it, it affects the likelihood of a fire starting. So what happens once the fire starts? What's the difference in fire behavior? So we looked at this in five different Wyoming Big Sagebrush Step communities, and we looked at it compared to four years of exclusion. I'm showing you essentially this um, figure of our fire weather. The main reason I'm do doing this is just to show you the variability in our actual fire weather. So we had relative humidity down to 17% and wind um, speeds up to 20 kilometers per hour. We burned in, in September of 2014 and the wildfire season was still active. The, um, there was two fires that were just being mopped up essentially north and south of our study plot. And this is about as good as you can get. You know, the wildfire season was still active. It was kind of winding down, but it's really hard to get fires any more essentially dangerous than this or more similar to an actual wildfire. So this is looking at maximum temperature during the fire. And why this is important is that the higher the maximum temperature is, the more light, the more severe that fire is, the more likely it is to be causing mortality of other vegetation besides the ones that are just fire sensitive, like sagebrush. And in this, we looked at two different zones. The inner space is the area between sagebrush canopies. And then of course the sub canopy is the area directly underneath a sagebrush canopy. The reason we looked at these two different um, microsites essentially is that when you're underneath a sagebrush canopy, you're under a lot of woody vegetation. Theoretically, it's going to have a lot uh, hotter fires because of that burning of woody material, all that caloric release from the, the wood. And then of course the grazed is the black and the, uh, the ungrazed area is the gray. And what we see is that yes, the sub canopy was hotter than the inner space, but more importantly, was whether or not it was grazed or not. If it was grazed, the maximum temperature in the inner space and also the sub canopy was about 100 degrees Celsius less than the ungrazed. And matter of fact, it's almost cutting it in half. The other thing we of course wanted to look at is heat loading. And that is essentially the amount of time that at, um, the temperatures are elevated above 60 degrees Celsius. And this is important because the longer the temperatures are elevated, the higher the likelihood that our native perennial grasses are gonna suffer mortality during the fire. So UG stands for, of course, ungrazed and sub, sub and sub stands for sub canopy. So the top one right here with the open triangle is the ungrazed sub canopy area for the sagebrush. And you can see that it's very hot there and it has a lot of heat loading over time, a high likelihood of mortality there. If we look for the gray sub canopy, it's essentially as low as the inner space in the grazed area. So grazing is having a huge effect on heat loading, greatly reducing it. And then of course the inner space in the grazed area is barely having any heat loading. It's not hardly going up at all. What we can really see though here is that the grazing influences both the sub canopy and the inner space region greatly. And in the sub canopy region, you would think the sagebrush would completely run the show, but actually whether or not it has that dry dead fuel built around it is determining how engaged that fire is uh, or how, how much that fire is engaging that shrub. <clears throat> 
looking at the actual fire behavior characteristics, we saw from a single ignition, which is essentially we, we light the entire side of one of the plots on fire, that it burned over 60% of the plots in the ungrazed area, and then only a little over 20, 22% of the area was burned in the grazed area. So we're having almost three times as much area burned in the ungrazed area, which this equates to there's a lot more unburned patches in areas that were grazed. The rate of spread was about three times greater in the ungrazed. So all that buildup of fuel, that continuity that we talked about earlier, that promoted a much faster moving fire. And this also resulted in greater flame depth. So the area is burning at one time, as well as flame height was almost three times greater in these ungrazed areas, which means we have a faster moving fire with much greater flame heights, means much more dangerous to, to try to put out, as well as more difficult to suppress. And this requires switching from, say, direct attack in the ungrazed area to have to use indirect in the ungrazed area. Grazing is greatly reducing the behavior of the fire. This is just two pictures, one of the winter grazed area after the fire and then of the ungrazed area after the fire. And what you need to see and take away from these pictures is the fact of how complete the fire is in the ungrazed area. Almost all the fuel out there was burned up, all the shrubs, there's not unburned patches out there. You look into the winter grazed area, you can see there's a lot of unburned patch out there. There's actually sagebrush that got missed. So winter grazing greatly influenced the completeness of the fire, that being a lot, lot more complete fire if it was not grazed, had that buildup of fire. And it was also a much more severe fire. As you can see, by those gray spots where sagebrush plants used to be, that's a pretty hot fire there. So we've established the effects on fuel the likelihood of a fire starting, then also fire behavior. Next, we're gonna talk about post-fire response to whether it was grazed or not prior to the fire. We looked at three sites for this. And of course, the two treatments were grazed and ungrazed before the fire. After the fire, we just stepped back and let them go to see what the treatment before the fire did. They were burned in 93, and then we have over two decades of post-fire monitoring of these um, sites. So this is biomass production. The black is the grazed there that was grazed before the fire. And then the white striped is the area that was not grazed before the fire. POSE is our Sandbergs bluegrass. PG is our large perennial bunch grasses. BRTE is cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum, our exotic annual grass. And PF is our native perennial forbs. And then we have AF, which is annual forbs, which is a mixture of native and exotics with probably being more exotics, um, annual forbs in there. Notice that there's a break in the graph so that the uh, intervals actually become larger after the, after the break. And what we see if we look at perennial bunch grasses where they were grazed before the fire, there's, a, there's about double the amount of production in the areas that were pre-fire pre grazed. The ungrazed has about half the amount of native perennial bunch grass production. What's going on here? We end up losing about half the perennial bunch grasses in the ungrazed area because of a hotter fire. And also then the, the change in the structure of the perennial bunch grass probably make them more susceptible to fire by having those large dead crowns as well as more fuel sitting on top of them. So we lost a lot of perennial bunch grasses. Where'd that go? Went right here, it went to cheatgrass. If you look at this, we have about tenfold more cheatgrass production in the ungrazed area. So that buildup of fuel allowed us to lose perennial bunch grasses, open that plant community up to exotic annuals and cheatgrass took advantage of that. We also could see a very similar problem if we look over at the perennial forbs, that they were reduced by about half in the ungrazed and correspondingly, annual forbs, primarily exotics, increased in that ungrazed area after fire. So essentially, by not grazing this prior to the fire, it created an opportunity to switch this plant community 
from perennial dominated to annual dominated. This is just two pictures, one showing the area that was grazed before the fire and then the other one showing the area that was not grazed before the fire. And like I said at the beginning of this, this is all moderate, well-managed grazing. This is not uh, um, grazing willy-nilly. But what you see in these pictures is that the, the area that was grazed before the fire, after the fire is dominated by perennial bunch grasses, you can see bare ground between them. You go over to the area that was not grazed and then burned, and it's dominated by exotic annual grasses, cheat grass. And this is taken at the same time of the year, and you've got all this residual dry fuel from the cheat grass that would essentially would promote another fire in here. So proper grazing decreases fire risk and severity. So grazing can decrease fire risk by altering the fuels. It can also increase the resilience to the wildfire by creating a situation where we have lower temperatures and lower um, heat loading during the fire, as well as more unburned patches within a fire, which can be critical for natural recovery, especially stuff like sagebrush that doesn't disperse very far. If it's a complete fire and has to disperse from the edge, how far that edge is is from the where you want to recover is great going to greatly affect its recovery time. Grazed areas when they burn are are much more suppressible. We have a slower moving fire. We've got reduced flame lengths. It allows for a more direct attack versus indirect attack. Now that all that being said, this will all vary of course by plant community composition and fire weather. We're not going to have a fire that we can jump on top of no matter whether it grazed or didn't graze, if it's moving at 40 miles an hour with you know 40 mile an hour winds. But even during those big wildfires we have that have extreme fire weather, there's periods of time when the fires or weather is less severe and will create opportunities to get more fire line put in place and stuff like that. The other thing with proper grazing to manage fire risk is that it needs to be a strategic and a flexible plan. Most of our big wildfire years happen after a year or two of above average production. Essentially, we're loading fuel out there. That's when we need to be using grazing to reduce fuels and manage it. That being said, we're probably not going to have enough cows to graze everything to the level we want to, nor do we want to graze everything down because you do need to have a diversity of habitats out there. And that's where we need to have a strategic plan to get the most bang for our buck and to put grazing where we need it and where it'll be desirable versus where it won't be. And that's the advantage of extending growing or extending grazing seasons into the winter and using that as an opportunity to graze when we generally aren't grazing a lot of these ranges. A real important point here, I've been talking a lot in the last bit about all this benefits of grazing, but grazing is not a binomial term. It's not that grazing is just grazing. If we're doing improper grazing, we can greatly decrease our perennial bunch grasses and, and essentially do all the negative effects that we would, would have of an undesirable catastrophic fire, ultimately leading to increases in exotic annuals, dominance by exotic annuals even. Whereas proper grazing, we can use that and we can maintain our perennial bunch grass dominance and limit exotic annuals. The trick, of course, is that we need to balance between the two and recognize what we're doing and plan what we're doing so that we're getting the perfect, or not perfect, but a good balance between reducing the fire threat and severity and maintaining our perennial bunch grasses, of course, in the absence of fire. I would like to thank you for uh, listening to my uh, talk and I guess I'll answer questions now. Great, thank you so much, Kirk. All right, the first question is, Generally, oh, and um, if you want to ask a question, please type it, type your question into your questions window and I'll field them for Kirk. Um, generally, how long do you need between germination of seeded perennial grasses and grazing? It's a little bit variable because essentially it's, we need to get to the point that that plant can't be pulled out of the ground. And so the best method I have seen is the overly sophisticated method of walking out there and grabbing that plant and trying to pull it out. If you can pull out the plants, they'll get pulled out by cows. Usually two years is enough. Sometimes it takes three, maybe even longer, but I would recommend not trying to do a general rule. 
but actually going out there and seeing if you can pull them out. If you can pull them out by hand, they're probably not um, established enough to be grazed. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, was the higher likelihood of fire spreading on the fall grazed range in August because it had more annual grass? No, um, they were they were both areas that were dominated by natives. It was just that um, it had at all the fuel from that year still there and that had then dried out. Whereas you had more fuel removed with spring grazing because it consumed the fuel from that year, that spring, or a portion of it. Great, thank you. Um, and this next question refers to your response to fire graph. And they um, were just wondering how long after the fire um, was that information or those results? Was that two decades or was that? That, was, uh, that was from 15 years after fire. Okay, great, thank you. Um, in the plots that you burned in 1993, comparing grazed ungrazed, were the sites grazed post fire? No. So we only wanted to see the response of just what happened before the fire. And they were actually part of long-term exclosures we have at the Northern Great Basin Experimental Range. And so the plan was they would continue to be exclosures. And of course the area grazed before that was just then fenced in too. So it was only looking at pre-fire effects of, of grazing. Okay, great. Um, this next question is from um, Steve Popovich, who's uh, the BLM National Program Lead for Fire Rehab out of DC. And so he wants you to know that this question is from him. He says, thank you for a very informative webinar and I appreciate your unbiased and well-balanced approach. Question, on the slide showing response by functional group to fire, remind us of the total sample size and number of replicates for the graph showing cheatgrass biomass production um, in no grazing, or, or why it was so much higher than cheatgrass production under grazing. So, I think he's asking how many replicates. So we had only three replicates for that study because of course they were ex um, long-term exclosures. Mm -hmm. And then each one of the study plots, I'd have to look at, it, but it was roughly like 50 by 60 or 50 by 50 meters. So relatively small plots but it was replicated five times and the results were pretty um, pretty standard between the different um, sites. Okay, great, thanks. And Steve, if I missed part of that question, please um, you know, let me know. Okay, next question. In the 15 year post photo set, what was the cheatgrass cover before the fire and what was the post fire grazing pattern? So there was almost no cheatgrass at all in any of those ones before fire, whether they were grazed or not grazed. And of course, as I answered in the other question, um, they were not grazed after the fire. So all we want, all we're looking at there was what was the effect of if they were grazed or not grazed prior to the fire. And then after that, they were left alone. Great. Um, okay, you mentioned our cool season perennial grasses are most vulnerable to grazing in the spring. What are some specific strategies for managing grazing that promote perennial grass health and vigor while reducing fuels? Well, I think one of the easiest things to do is, is limit the number of times or limit the amount they're grazed during the spring. So of course, you know, we need to graze in the spring or people that are producing livestock need to because that, that's the best time, most high quality forage. So it's, not, it's not a problem with doing that. The problem is repeatedly doing it to the same pasture over and over again. We see where we have a pasture that's repeatedly grazed in the spring that over time you will start seeing a reduction in perennial bunch grasses. So it needs to be alternated with a, a deferment grazing where it's grazed after the growing season and then also infrequently it just needs periods of complete rest. And so it needs to be in a rotation with other fills to accomplish that. The other key thing too is that even if it is being grazed, we want to keep that utilization level down. You know, 50% and less on our native rangelands in general is a pretty safe bet, especially if it's not going to be repeatedly used every spring year after year. And that way there will be enough photosynthetic material left that they'll um, do well and they won't be put at enough 
competitive disadvantage that they'll start shrinking over time as stuff like sagebrush increases. Great, thank you. Will herbicides that control annual grasses have similar effects to grazing? On annuals, um, yeah, we can we can reduce them. Um, the trouble is that the scale and the cost would be prohibitively expensive across large areas. Um, herbicides for fuel management probably is, is restricted largely in terms of cost to fuel breaks. They're not going to be something we can treat large landscapes with by any means because of the cost of it. And the cost would be year after year after year because, well, not every year, but you're only going to get a year or two success from most of these herbicides. And sometimes we don't even have that. Sometimes we only have a, a small reduction if the, the timing and the weather is not cooperative with the herbicide we used. I hope that answered that question. I think so. And um, and there's the litter issue too, right? Yes. And, and that is a good deal. Even if we control it in that year, the litter will still be there. So it's still fuel. And then it's going to take another year or more, depending on on what annual grass it is for that litter to start breaking down enough. So there's there's substantial um, difficulties to using herbicides unless we're going to use them in a fuel break situation where we're going to use them over and over again to essentially create a, you know, a bare strip through the land. Great, thanks. Are there any programs going on, <clears throat> excuse me, going on now that are working with ranchers to put these ideas into practice? And if so, are they generally receptive to trying this? Yes, there's quite a few of these, um, and not just, you know, in Oregon and Nevada, they're going on, and with University of uh, Nevada, Reno. I know in the Burns District here that they've been attempting to do some of this, and they've been pretty happy with it. Um, one of their biggest challenges, of course, is, is NEPA, and they're working through that. And that's the part where it's about strategic and flexible. When you're talking about public lands, that needs to get rode in so they can do it. But um, yeah. And most private um, ranchers seem very receptive of it. And I think they've, especially in areas that they've experienced large wildfires, that they're, they're seeing the threat as well as the advantage of potentially going out and utilizing forage that could reduce their, um, their hay feeding costs. Great. Can you suggest an indicator and threshold to determine when to pull livestock off of fall winter pasture to reduce annuals and maintain perennial grass? Um, it really depends on the goal, but what I would be looking at is if I start seeing our large perennial bunch grasses start greening up, I would, I would start becoming concerned and, and wanting to pull them off. Now, if you're going out there and you can can see that they're not selecting them, that they're just selecting the annuals, I'd be fine with that. Now, of course, if you're talking about one native perennial bunch grass and a sea of cheat grass, you know, it's probably not going to matter. It's it's a relic. It's not probably going to survive. The bigger issue is probably reducing the fire risk to the surrounding area by cutting down the annual grasses. So it will be you know driven by the objectives of the land managers. But if it's a mixed community, I would be very cautious as soon as I start seeing my large perennial bunch grasses getting grazed. Great. Has this been published in a journal yet? Uh, let's see, almost all this has been published. The only thing that hasn't been published yet was the stuff from the buzzard fire. So there's a couple um, papers, I think the first one in 2009, and that was with the grazing before fire. And then another one came out of that study in 2016. And then the, the uh, fire propagation study, essentially it came out last year in International Journal of Wildland Fire. So it's all out there. And if you guys want to send me an email for specific stuff, I'll be more than happy to share the PDFs with you. Great, thank you. How does grazing affect root volume of perennial grasses? Well, it's the same as the basal area. Essentially, it's if the basal area is shrinking, that means that the volume above ground and below ground is shrinking. 
And so that's where the issue becomes. If we're grazing to the point that they're shrinking, they're taking up less resources. Grazing in general can be done to minimize that so that it's not natively infecting it. But as the plant's grazed, it does shut down um, growth of roots for a little while as it replenishes its above ground um, photosynthetic material. Thank you. How, when to graze cheatgrass for forage benefit, but without compromising natives? Um, the biggest advantage is if it's growing in like the fall and the winter when our natives aren't. Now, um, that's when it's, you know, it's green, it's valuable. Um, you can also add supplements out there and, and make it valuable, but it's of course more valuable if it's green. In the spring, if it's co-mixed, both are going to get grazed, and at that point, you just have to be cognizant that if you overgraze the native perennials, if they're selecting them over the annuals, then you're going to have a problem. And we see it even more with Medusa than cheatgrass that they'll, you know, start selecting just the natives. And that with with Medusa head, it's when you start getting that, you know, very spiny on sticking out, which um, that's the issue as as that. With cheatgrass, it's more as it decreases in value, then they select the green natives. So if they're both green, you're probably getting equal selection. Great, thanks. In the 1993 exclosures, if there was no cheatgrass before the fire and no grazing afterward, where did all the post-fire cheatgrass come from? So cheatgrass is naturalized across the sagebrush steppe, well, across the US actually, it's even in Alaska. So there's, you know, there's going to be a little bit of seed and stuff out there, but um, it just increased over time. In the first couple of years after fire, those sites just look kind of, you know, um, underproductive. You know, there wasn't a bunch of cheatgrass there, but the print bunch grass were reduced. But then over time, cheatgrass started, you know, proliferating out there. And pretty soon, you know, you can see it all over out there. And you can go out into the areas that aren't burned right next to them, and they're still very little cheatgrass out there. But once you go inside that burn, there's quite a bit of cheatgrass. So it's always there, you know, there's no place that cheatgrass isn't in the U.S. and especially in the stage for a step. But it was not, you know, in the abundance that you could detect it. I would say, if I remember correctly, that, that you know, you're talking about, you know, a couple plants per probably, you know, a 50 by 50 meter plot. And sometimes you wouldn't even find any but it's just that it's just there in the background. Great, thanks. Are perennial forbs important as a forage source? Yes, yeah, so uh, perennial forbs are critical to like sage grass, stuff like that. They're really high in protein as well as they serve as a host plant for a lot of insects for um, different wildlife species, especially sage grass. Um, some of our perennial forbs are also pretty highly nutritious to livestock too. So yeah, perennial forbs are, and the, the old range terminology, they were oftentimes called, called ice cream plants. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and the time to allow natives to reestablish, oh, let's see, I'm reading that wrong, let me look. The time to allow natives to reestablish and outcompete the cheatgrass. This must have been tacked onto a different question, and I'm not understanding. So, if you want to retype it, that that would be great. Thanks. Okay, the next one. How does moderate fall winter grazing impact biological soil crust cover and density? So, what we saw wasn't a, any real. Um, there wasn't any real difference between it and the ungrazed. Now, the ungrazed, of course, it was ungrazed only for for four or five years. Now, if we go and look at some of the long-term exclosures, there's very little soil crust out there, you know, from historic grazing. Um, clearly, you know, any kind of disturbance affects soil crust to some degree, but um, repeatedly, this research has shown that fire is a much bigger deal than grazing, and especially cheatgrass invasion. So it's, Either one's going to have some effect on soil modulate crust. That's you know any disturbance, whether it's fire or grazing. Um, so it, it does affect it. We didn't find any huge evidence difference between them, but of course we were only looking at winter grazing for a short period of time, and of course it's pretty diffuse compared to say intensive grazing where there'd be a lot of hoof action. But yes, it has an effect. <laughs> 
Great. How do the impacts of grazing on invasive annual grass distribution fit into this strategy? I'm, I'm guessing they're talking about the livestock um, moving annual grasses around. And so that can be a concern. So if we're talking about, especially something like Medusa head, that's often not everywhere yet, versus cheatgrass everywhere already, we don't really have to be worried about dispersing it to places that is not already there. Medusa head, Ventanata, they often grow on clay soils. If that soil is wet and you're going in there, stepping in there and moving to areas that aren't grazed, there is some risk that we're spreading it to areas that it, it hasn't been. Now, a lot of times these annual grass areas are are pretty heavily annual grass invaded already. So if they're not leaving that area, not going into uninvaded areas, it's not an issue. But it definitely falls into that, that the plan needs to be you know, strategically applied and flexible, but strategically that there's areas that we won't want to winter graze or we can't, you know, but there definitely needs to be some thought put into these and make sure that we're not creating more problems for ourselves. Great, thanks. Um, assuming you're referencing cattle as livestock class for most data and discussions, and the discussion might differ if we're referencing impacts of sheep browsing? Yes, that's a good point. Um, at this point, most Western rangelands are just grazed by cattle, but there is still sheep. There's still other animals like horses, but um, Yes, it's about cows, and definitely there is going to be a difference. We use sheep, especially since sheep will consume sagebrush, where cows really won't. So um, this is all about cattle, and it uh, it would be different if it was sheep. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going back to the question that I was tripping over. I think the questioner was asking how much time do we need to allow natives to reestablish and outcompete the cheatgrass, but does that go back to your um, response to another um, questioner about like going out and pulling the, um, if you can pull out the natives and they shouldn't be grazed or something like that? Yeah, I think so. I think the only thing I could add on that in case they're talking about it just natural recovery. Mm -hmm. um, if cheatgrass is established in any amount here in our lower elevation sagebrush communities, natives aren't going to re recover into those and out compete them. They're going to have to do something about the annual grasses because the annual grasses are much more competitive than the seedlings of, of our desirable perennial bunch grasses in these lower elevation sagebrush communities. Now, as we move up into mountain big sagebrush communities, you know, 12 plus inches, 13, 14 inches, yeah, we may have a cheatgrass problem, but over time, um, natives can reestablish back into them. Great, thank you. Well, that looks like the last question. Thank you all for your participation and great questions. Um, oh, there's one more. In uh, TACA, T-A-C-A infested areas, I don't know what that is. Is there, a th is there a threshold cover beyond which grazing will impair the perennial grasses too much because of forage preference? Yeah. I don't know what the threshold would necessarily be, but if there's a lot of Medusa head out there, and as soon as that Medusa head starts putting on its, you know, ons, then the, then the the cattle are not going to, to graze it, and they will preferentially seek out anything other than that because those ons are pokey. Um, it's variable though, but it's something that if, if they're grazing at that time of year, we should be considering the amount of forage that's been lost and adjusting stocking rates accordingly. Great, thank you. All right, <clears throat> um, yes, well, thanks again for all of your participation. Please join us for our next webinar in the cheatgrass management series, capitalizing on strategic opportunities to reduce cheatgrass, examples from the field with Brian Mueller and Mike Pellant on April 25th. Um, we would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey that will appear after this webinar has ended. I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon. And that YouTube channel has um, uh, the other two um, presentations from this cheatgrass management series as well. Um, and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. If you have further questions regarding this or other webinars, please call or email me anytime. Again, thanks you, thank you all for attending and thank you so much, Kirk, for your presentation. Well, thank you.
All right. Have a great day, everybody.